Um, oops, sorry. Um, everybody successful in opening it? Okay, let's do the first thing that unfortunately we have to check for, and that's to make sure that you have all of your plugins so that you have access to all of the tools. Um, with LightWave open, okay, um, or Modeler, I have just Modeler at the moment. Doesn't make any difference. Let me go ahead and open LightWave 2. Um, what you'll do is select the tab at the top, Utilities. Click on down at the bottom where it's over to the left where it says Plugins, where it says Edit Plugins, not Add Plugins, but Edit Plugins. So, um, click on that button. Um, window will pop up. And then what you want to do is scan the directory. You click on that button. Then we have to go back out. So what we can do, I'm at the plugins. If I'm at Live LightWave 8, select that folder. If you're not, what you can do is go all the way back to the hard drive, which is here. Select applications. Okay. And for devil, whoops, did it just crash? Okay. Something happened. So I hope this didn't crash. Looks like it did. Oh man, I'm sorry. <coughs> okay, my computer just crashed, so I'm gonna turn the video recorder off. And I'm Okay, once again. So if you're missing plugins, and you'll notice that you are, particularly when you cr select the Create tab, and you, you'll notice that you're probably missing maybe half of them at least, then select the Utilities panel, click on Edit Plugins, okay? Don't select Add Plugins, just scan the directory. Let's hope it doesn't crash again. Okay, now I'm going to go back out and I'm just going to select the LightWave 8 folder. When I do look at all the folders within LightWave 8, when I scroll down, there should be plugins right here. Don't click inside the plugins folder, just click on the plugins folder and then click open. Wait, and in a few seconds, it should pop up. It'll say here, 524 plugins found and 239 files, and we click OK. And if you're missing any, missing any, you'll notice that a whole bunch more pop up here. I'm not missing any. OK, does that make sense to you? And then when you're done, you just click Done. And you should notice immediately more tools if you are missing any. If you're still missing them and it didn't find the plugins and something is wrong, we need to put a note under the keyboard of the computer and have them reinstall it because something is really seriously missing. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Do you have pretty much the same tools I do? Or are you missing some? Click over here on Create. Um, Yep, you're missing a bunch. Okay, so go back, click on, on Utilities, click on Edit Plugins. Looks like you have most of them. We have Plugins, go ahead and just click OK. Click OK and click Done. Go back to Create. Uh, what are we missing? Curves. We're missing some of the curves. Let's see what we can do today. You have most of what we'll need for today and we'll sure. be fine. You're, well, you're also on, yeah, you are in Modeler. Okay. Okay. Yes.
Okay, let's click here. We don't want that. I don't know how we got to the library. Like, like you want application. Oh, application. Uh huh. And we come down to Light Wave 8. And then we select the plugins. And then we click open. So you are missing a whole bunch. And you'll notice in a minute, as soon as it lines up, we click OK, see how they're added and then done. Now you go back to create and you have them all. Okay. So you are missing a couple, but we should be able to function for today. Then the other thing I'd like you to do is to bring up the numeric requester. You can do that by clicking below where it says numeric, or you can hit the N key on your keyboard, and you might also want the statistics panel. That's also found down here, or you hit the W key, and that will open that up. Okay, so what I want to do today is start with some basic building tools. And we're going to work with the, the primitives here. Build a simple table, and build a lamp on top of it, and as we do that, what we're going to do is we're going to add some surfaces. We're going to um, use some shortcuts for building it. Mm -hmm. uh, so it says a lamp and a uh, uh -huh. because it's very uh, fast surface. The what? You might want to try a different computer if you're missing some. Sure. Okay. So I want to build a table. Think of what parts you know constitute a table. You have the top table top, and you have the legs. Okay. So I'm not determining yet what properties or what materials the table is made of. It's just I have a top and I have legs. So it basi it's basically five parts. I'm assuming that there's four legs on the table and we have the top. So we just have five parts. So I have five different pieces that will make up that table. <coughs> Think of a box or a squished box for the table top. The legs can be cylinders, they can be little thin rectangles, they can be tapered, they can be all different kinds of shapes. It depends on what kind of table you want to create. I'm just going to use cylinders. But let's start by creating the table top. So I just select the box tool, like so, and there's a variety of ways that I can work. The way I like to work is that I will start by clicking and dragging and stretching on the top view to determine the overall size or footprint of my table. And I can do that by clicking and dragging like so. And if I look in the perspective view, and to actually manipulate the perspective view, it's this little widget right here, or this little button, that looks like a, it's a double arrow that's an elliptical pattern. But if I click on that, and I push up and I move to the right or the left, you can see how I can spin around and view the perspective view from different, you know, my, a different eye level. I can change it m how I'm looking at that in 3D mode. And you'll also see from the back view and the right view that it's just a flat plane. It has no dimension to it at the moment. <coughs> If I want to give it thickness, now I would have to move to the back or the right view. And you'll see the little blue widgets in the corner and the sides and in the center. If I click on the center, it allows me to move this anywhere on that Y plane. If I wish to change the dimensions of it, I can click on one of these widgets and it will allow me to stretch it. If I click on this widget, it will allow me to stretch it in that direction. If I click on the corner, it allows me to resize it both X and Y. Or I'm should, I should say X and Z, sorry. And if I wish to change the Y dimension, then I have to move to the back view or the right view. And I can click from the center and move it up like so. Now that's a pretty thick tabletop. And it's probably pretty large too. If you want to know how big the thing is, or how thick it is, now we look over to the numeric requester right here. 
and it tells me the width is a little over two meters, so that's six feet long. The height is 250 meters or millimeters. That's fairly large, okay? The depth is one meter. So the depth is about right. It's one meter. I want to make a little square table. It's one meter by one meter. So I can either move these widgets or, you know, there's the, the tools here, or I can reset it from here. It's probably easier if I just, m if I reset it from here. So what I'm going to do is change the width from two to one meter. And since units are in meters, all I have to, have to do is hit one and then hit the tab key. And notice it changes to one. The height is a bit thick. 250 millimeters is way too thick for a tabletop. Maybe I want my tabletop, it's gonna, still going to be a thick table, but maybe it's only going to be maybe two inches thick. Okay? Well, here's an interesting feature that LightWave has. Even though at present we're working in meters, it converts units of measurement for you very easily. So all I have to do is type in two, and I have to type in the mathematical um, notation for inches, which is the double quote. And I hit the tab key, and notice it flattens it to 50.8 millimeters, which is two, converts to two inches. It does the conversion for you, which is pretty cool. Did everybody get that? Now, the placement of this it shows the center at 12.5 millimeters, 12.5 millimeters, and the Z is zero. If you wish to move these, if I wanted to move this up a specific height, I can do that. So I would move that along the Y axis, wouldn't I? To do that, Tables are typically maybe 30 inches off the ground. So I can type in 30, hold down the shift key and put in double quotes, hit the tab key and notice it miraculously moves up exactly 30 inches. Now I could move, if I clicked on the center widget here, I can move this up or down or to the side, but you need to be careful. No, I goofed, so I gotta go back. I said undo and the whole thing went away. So I'm gonna go ahead and go ahead and activate this and it brings it back to where it was. And now I have to check and make sure that notice that my Y is over 700. Now I have another way of moving it. I can also use these spinners along to the side. And if I click and I drag along here, notice that that moves and it changes the height. I'm gonna go back to 700 can change the center for 1250. Notice how that's moving that over to the left, to the right. I can make sure that this is exactly at zero. So I'll put in zero and hit the tab key. The Z is minus 250. I'm gonna make that zero and hit the tab key so that I have it centered in my universe. It's one meter by one meter, meaning it's like a card table. It's a little over three feet by three feet, and it's two inches thick. You can make these whatever size you want, but what I, more important, what I'm trying to get you to do at the moment is to size and move your objects as you're building them from the numeric requester. And also, feel free to use the, the, the top, bottom, and right views to, to resize, move, and create your file, your, your, your objects from here. Okay, yeah. Well, what do you mean, you, it had, did you deselect the tool yet? Because as long as this is still selected, we can always go back and you can, um, you can't hit, hit Command Z, but you can put in the new, um, you know, different settings in here to change it. Once I have turned off the box tool, 
now it's fixed in space. Now if I want to undo it, if I hit Command Z, it removes the, the box. And then I'd have to start all over again. What it will do though, okay, so uh, what if I decide, you know what, I didn't do this right. If I hit Command X to cut it, and it goes away, and I select the box tool again, and I look at the settings, the settings in the box tool are the last settings that I used. So now when I select Action Activate, it just goes back to what I had before. And when I'm ready to turn off the box, I either click on the tool to turn it off or I hit X, um, Shift X, I should say, sorry. Oh, come on, to turn it off. So now, my, now it's fixed in space. And now if I wish to resize it or I wish to move it, I can do that. I don't have to remake it. But to do that, then I have to use the modify tools, which is what we'll use in a little bit. So now I have a whole other set of tools that allow me to resize, to stretch, to move, to do whatever. A whole bunch of different tools. And when I'm done using those tools, then I turn those off. I'm sorry, a question? Okay, sure thing. That's, I'm sorry, I thought that one was working. Say again. Command Z is undo. It's still Command Z is to undo. Um, but once I've made the object, if I hit Command Z, then it it un it unmakes the object. If I choose T for move, and I move it over here. Whoops! I have points selected, so I'm sorry. I got to make sure that I have. Um, I don't want anything selected here. So I hit Command T. And I go ahead and I move it. Why isn't it moving? My keyboard shortcuts are not working. Here's move. Oh, it's just T. What am I thinking here? And I just move it. And I don't like where it's moved if I hit Command Z. Oh, come on. Command Z. Why aren't you moving back? How about just Z? No, Command Z. Okay, let's go to edit, undo, command Z. Why my keyboard is not working, I don't know. Should be command Z to bring them back. Also, if I wish to move it a specific distance in the X, Y, or Z coordinates, notice when I select the translate tool and I look over at the numeric requester, it gives me offset distances here as well that I can use as spinners or I can put in specific increments of movement here. Okay. So now I'm ready to build the legs. I have my tabletop, now I'm ready to build the legs. What I choose to do <coughs> in here will be the following. I'm going to go ahead and zoom in just a little bit. So to zoom in from any one of these portals, I'm going to, or quadrants, I'm going to click on the little magnification tool and zoom in a bit. And when I do, notice how the, z the grid changes a little bit. It becomes a little bit tighter. And now what I'm going to do to make my cylindrical legs is that I'm going to switch back to create and I'm going to select the disk tool. The disk tool makes disks, but it also is used when you extrude it to make cylinders. In a cylinder, a box is one kind of primitive, a cylinder is another kind of primitive. Primitives are basic geometric forms. That's all they are. So now I can, again, from the top view, because I want to, from the get-go, I want to place fairly accurately, it doesn't have to be perfect, but I want to place the, one of the, the legs of my table. So I move over the corner here, and I click and I drag, and you'll notice that I have, if I just look at the top view, you'll notice it looks like, you know, I mean, you're looking right down the cylinder. You just see a circle. Is it a perfect circle or not? I don't know. It looks pretty perfect, but I won't know until I look over here into my numeric requester, and you'll notice the radius along the X and the Z are 50, mil 50 millimeters each. 
So I know that it is a perfect circle. But you'll notice that when I look at the, the back and the right view, I just have a disk. I don't have a cylinder, do I? So now what I, now what I can do is I can move from either the back or the right view, and I can click and drag from the center up until it reaches the underside of the tabletop, and voila, I have one leg. Everybody see that? The next thing that I want to do, and I've already made one little mistake, but it's not the end of the world. Okay. Is that uh, the other thing that I want to do now is that I want to make three additional legs that are identical to this one. See, be, so before I turn off disk, what I'm going to do is hold down the command key and then click and drag on this. Or if you have a three button mouse, you right click and drag and you automatically make a copy of it when you do that. And notice that it makes this one permanent now and this one now is in the edit mode. So I could resize this if I want, but I don't want to. I want them all to be identical. So I will right click again or command click on the center and drag it. And you'll notice that now I have a third leg and I right click or command click one more time and move it over. And now I have my fourth leg and they are all identical to one another. And I did that from the top view because I only wanted it to slide around on that Y plane. I didn't want it to move up or down. And now when I'm, that I'm done with the fourth leg, I can turn it off. Now there's one basic thing that I've done that I've forgotten about. And I mentioned this the other day in the procedures, and it's, again, it's my little deal that I like to do. And I just, and I do think it is good habit, a good habit or good practice to get into, is that right now I have a tabletop and I have legs that are this generic white default surface. And later on, I'm going to make the leg, legs and the, t and the top have different surfaces, a different look to them. Maybe the top will be wood, maybe it'll be glass, and maybe the legs will be made out of metal. I don't know, maybe I want a modern looking table. Maybe I want them both to look like they're wood so it looks pretty traditional. Who knows? But if I think that they're going to be different surfaces, then I need to set up a placeholder. So a after I created the top, I should have done that, and I didn't. So watch what happens. One of the things that you need to remember in LightWave is that if nothing is selected, then everything is selected. Does that make sense, sort of? Watch and you'll see that if I want to go ahead and I'm thinking to myself, I only want the top to be selected. Well, the top and the legs are on the same layer. <clears throat> and that's what these are up here. These are layers. And we'll get to that when we work with the lamp. And you'll see what I mean, how we'll use different layers. <clears throat> okay. So if I go ahead and I hit Q to create a new surface, I don't want this to be my new default. I'll call it table top. And just to give it a generic color, make it kind of brownish or bluish, it doesn't matter. I'll put it over in this realm so it's kind of brown, I guess. And I click OK. Oops, click OK. And I click OK. Everything turns brown, doesn't it? The reason everything turned brown is because nothing was selected. Since nothing is selected, then everything is selected. So how do I get around that if I have all of this on the same layer? I have to think of a way of selecting these. Since this is a placeholder, let me um, just sit back and watch. There's a couple of ways that I can do this. If I just wanted to select the table top, what I can do is at the bottom here, you'll notice that we have points, polygons, and symmetry. 
points by default are what are, select or, or what are selected down here. So if I come up to my textured view, if I click on a corner, you'll see that a little point is selected. If I hold down the shift key and I click, begin to click on each of these corners, you'll notice that additional points are now selected. And if I'm not careful, I could click down here and you'll see that other points are selected, aren't they? It takes at least, for our purposes, three points to make a polygon. That's not true, but for our purposes, it's a good general rule. To deselect them, I have to go back and click on them, or I can move over here to the lower left-hand corner and click, and that will deselect them all. Okay, that gets kind of tedious, because what if you forget points? Maybe a better way would be to select polygons. In this case, for example, think of a cube. If a cube is constructed of six planes, isn't it? So each plane is considered a, would be considered a polygon. The cylinders are constructed of considerably more polygons. The sides, that's why you see all of these lines are constructed of 24 sides, so that's 24 polygons. And then you have a top and a bottom, so that means there's 28 or 26, I'm sorry. So the easiest one to select probably, since I said that's tabletop, um, I've already constructed a, <coughs> a surface for it. Um, but one of the things I might want to do is now construct one for the legs. So, so what are ways of so selecting the legs? There's a better way of doing this. And this may not be the most efficient way, but what I can do is I can, in any view here, I can click and drag to highlight some of the legs here. Okay? Then over here in the, the right view, I can click and drag, hold down the shift key and click and drag to highlight some of the legs too, or some of the polygons in the legs. And you'll notice that they aren't all selected, are they? What I can do is I can switch to view. And then what I'm going to do over here, you see where there's a selection tab? Or the selection bar? And it says selection. I can say select connected. I know on each of these that the polygons are connected to one another. So now when I select connected, notice that they're all connected now. And they're all selected. Does that make sense, sort of? OK. So now that the legs are selected, I can hit Q once again. And now I can select, and we'll call it table legs. And I'll click a different color. And now we're going to make these blue, I guess. Maybe, I don't know, just for the heck of it. I click OK. I click OK again, and notice that they change. Now to deselect all of these, I move over in the lower left-hand corner. And I click, and they're deselected. So now I have created a different surface from these. <coughs> okay. So what if I wanted to separate these? Because right now, they are joined at the hip. If I want to move these, meaning the table and the legs, if I hit T for move, remember nothing is selected, so that means everything is selected. So from the top view, if I click and I drag, I'm sliding it along that Y plane. If I move it from the back view and I click and I drag and I move it up, I can move it along the Z plane. So I'm moving it along the X and the Y axis but that's along the z-axis of the z-plane. Command z to undo. And the same would be with the right view. I can move that up or down, <coughs> front, forwards, and backwards. <coughs> okay. One thing I haven't done yet is saved it. Another thing that I might want to do is click on the surface editor and bring that up. And you'll notice that I have my unnamed object, which has not been saved yet. Over to the left, I still have my default texture, which is this generic white. 
but I also have table legs and I have table top. And it's from here that I can now change the settings of the surface and they will automatically change in the object that I've created. But I'm, I prefer just creating placeholders and modeler and refining the surfaces when I switch to layout later on. Okay. So I've made my table. Now I'm ready to make a lamp and put my lamp on top of that. Okay, a lamp with a lampshade, and then we can take it over to layout and put a light in it, and we can have it cast, you know, the light to cast shadows and illuminate the room or whatever. We can do whatever we want. So now I need to name this, or uh, meaning to save it. So I'll go File, and I'll say, select Save Object As. Remember, I saved on my desktop a folder, Content Spring 09. I'm going to save it in Objects, and we'll name it as Table. And I'll click Save, and it's saved. Notice that the asterisk is no longer there, and you'll see here we have the name Table. <coughs> now I'm ready to create the lamp. But this is what I recommend that you do. Um, I could build a lamp directly on top of the table. But when I save it, it will still be saved under the name table. Well, this is a table and a lamp. If you recall the other day, I said good practice, I think, is to, to treat each of the objects that you create as separate entities. Okay. So what I'm going to do, since this is saved, <coughs> is I'm going to go to File and select up here in the the file menu, I, what I want to do is create a new object. Now it looks like my table has disappeared, it's gone away, it's closed, it has not. If I click on this tab here, you'll notice that the table is still there, isn't it? Okay, now this is what I prefer to do. So you might want to just watch for a minute. I need to have, I don't absolutely have to have, but I should, when I make my lamp, size it relative to the size of my table, shouldn't I? I mean, if I'm not careful, I could make a lamp that's as big as this room. I know because I use the numeric requester, the size of my table, that it's basically the size of a card table. It's about three feet by three feet, it's 30 inches off the ground, my legs, you know, work so it's about the actual size of a, of a real table in the real world but I don't know that when you look at the screen because all sizes are relative but when I make additional objects <coughs> I want to make them relative to one another sized relative to one another so that they appear correct if you want to change that like they did in a bug's life you know you can do that so that things appear larger or smaller you know I mean the, it, then that would work too. You can make oversized objects. Or Honey, I Shrunk the Kids. You know, I mean, it's that deal where people are small and objects are big. <coughs> you can do that. So this is what I do. <coughs> I hit Command C for copy. Now everything is copied. Now I switch to my new unnamed and I hit Command V for paste. Now, I'm only using this for the time being as a placeholder, and I will delete it later on. And you'll notice this is when I'm going to start to use layers. You'll notice that the table is occupied by this first layer. That's what these are. By default, you have 10 layers. And layers are either turned on in the foreground or they're, uh, or they're in the background or they're turned off. One of those three options, and that's it. It's not a typical stacking order that you think of like in Photoshop or Illustrator. They're either in the foreground, the background, or they're just simply turned off. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to click the second layer, and then I'm going to click the bottom half of the first layer. And you'll notice the table now 
is it, it's viewed as a, as a black outline. When you see an object or a thing viewed as a, bla as, a, as a black outline, it means it's in the background. Does that make sense? Now what I can do is I can use this background object for reference to size my lamp, okay, that can be placed on top of it. So now what I'll do is I'll come back over to create. <coughs> and what I can do is there's a variety of ways that you can make a lamp. Is it a square base? Is it is a, a spherical base? Is it elliptical base? You know, I, no, I don't know. What, what kind of base is this thing? So I've decided I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to use the ball tool to do that. And I'm going to turn off my surface editor for the time being. And over here in the top view, I'll go ahead and I'll click and I'll drag to create the base of my object. And I'll go ahead and then you'll notice from the front or the back or the right view that now when I click that the, the base of the table is actually, or the base of the lamp is actually underneath the table. So now I can click here in the center and I can drag it and I can move it up so that it's actually seated on top of the table. And LightWave will remember the position of these objects. So as I'm building my room, I can actually place all the objects relative to, the, to one another. I don't have to do that way, but with some good planning, it's not a bad idea. I can always move them around later on in layout. <coughs> Now if I want, I can resize this. I can make this, as I said, I'm going to go ahead and change the proportion of, th of this so that it's a little bit taller. It's more like kind of a bullet shape. So I want kind of a bullet shape for my lamp. Okay. Now I'm going to make some modifications to this. And there's a whole variety of ways that I can do this. But before I do, I'm going to make sure I have over here, <coughs> I want to make sure that the X and Z are the same dimensions. So I'll go ahead and I'll make it's mine. It doesn't matter that yours are 170 by 170, but I just want to make sure that this is a perfect um, circle. Does that make sense from the top view? If you guys, if I'm losing some of you guys, please let me know. Okay, and you'll notice that it's constructed of 24 sides, 12 segments, and if I want to change this, watch, I can go ahead and spin this, and what if I want this instead of um, a circle, I want this to be a different kind of a shape. Look at that. We've seen lamps like that, kind of funky looking modern lamps from the 60s. We could also make it just three sides too, so it looks like that. So again, the more polygons, the more sides you have, the rounder it looks, the fewer it looks considerably different, doesn't it? How about let's leave it four? And that looks kind of interesting. And now I'm ready to complete the ball, so I turn it off. But there is a few things that are wrong with it. This would tip over, wouldn't it? if I left it this way. Yeah. So what I need to do is I need to construct the base for this. It can either be a separate entity or I can use what I have. I, this is a complete object and what I'm going to do is eliminate some of the polygons and then I'm going to resize them to make it look like I have a base. Does that make sense? Okay, so what I'm going to do, <coughs> with nothing selected and polygons selected below, okay, let me go ahead and hit the zero key so I have this selected only and I'm going to zoom in. I'm going to delete some of these bottom polygons so that it will give me a flat base. So when you're viewing this in wireframe view, 
what I can do is command click or right click and I can select these polygons down below. And I can hit Command X for cut, and they've go, they're gone away now. Now if I go back out here, you'll notice that all of the polygons, it doesn't matter what view I'm looking at, are gone. Can repeat that? Huh? Can I repeat that? Yep. Whoops, I didn't want to do that. So let me redo that. I want to bring that back. Okay. Now watch, <clears throat> I'm going to do it slightly differently. If I select polygons from the texture view and I click, or if I even if I click again and I deselect, if I right click and I drag around here, notice that only half of them are selected, not all of them. The reason that is is that when you have a shaded view of some kind and you select it will only select the polygons that are visible from that side. If I go over here and I deselect them all in the lower left hand side, but I right click or command click and I lasso around them, when you, when you select from a wireframe view, it selects all the way through. Now you'll notice not just half are selected, but all of them are selected through. Now when I hit command X, I cut it and they're gone. <clears throat> One thing that you should notice, I mean there's a lot of things that you should notice, but if I'm looking at the underside of this and I've cut away this polygon, it looks pretty empty inside. You really don't see anything. There is no polygon here and you'll notice that um, when you create a primitive or any kind of object, LightWave intuitively knows that you're only going to view the outside polygons, so it's, they're one-sided. You only see those. When you, if you were to look at the, the, the inside of that shape, it looks like there's nothing there. And I will cover that later on to show you how to create your own polygons and how to create double-sided polygons and all that good stuff. But right now we're just working with these primitive shapes right now. Now, the other thing that I can do is that I want to expand the size of the base. So I have some options here. I'm going to switch back to points and then I'm going to right click around the bottom again because I just want these points selected on the bottom and that's it. I can move those points because they're connected to everything else. I can resize the points. I can do all sorts of things with this. So I'm going to hit T for move, and I'm going to go ahead and stretch this down here so that these points now touch the bottom, or the top, I should say, of the table. It still is a pretty narrow base, and it would probably tip over. So I want to expand that and make it broader now, don't I? Well, I have a number of tools that I can use for that. I have the size tool, I have the stretch tool, and those are found under Modify. So is Move. If I come down here to Size, watch what happens. Now this is kind of, this. now I'm going to lead into another tool. So as I introduce one way of doing things, it leads to another, which leads to another and another. So we're kind of going down, like an Alice in Wonderland, we're going down the rabbit hole here. We've got a whole bunch of things, but one leads to another. If I click from over here and I stretch it, Okay, I lucked out. Notice that it stretches and it makes it a nice broad base. So now I have this here and it looks like it's big enough that it will hold stand and hold up. I can make it bigger if I want and stretch this about as big as I want and it will hold up and it will look like it, it will it's not going to tip over. Now, I'm going to undo this and I'm going to do it again. <clears throat> and I want to show you something else. There is something called modes down at the bottom here. And you'll notice that the action center on mine was the selection. I'm going to go to the top where yours might be and the action center might be the mouse. So watch, from the top view if I click here and I drag, notice that it's resizing 
but it's moving in an opposite direction. It's not centered the way it was a moment ago. It's resizing based on the position of my mouse. It's like, oh my god, this just isn't working. Sometimes you'll want that, sometimes you won't. We also have the mode where the action center is the center of origin. Well, if I click here again, it works for the moment, sort of, but it's also considering the origin the center of the object, not the center of the selection. So this later on might be something that you want, something that you don't want. But again, these modes later on will become very important. Pivot point could be another one. Pivot point by, the, by default is generally the center of your object. Well, I wanted my action center to be the center of my selection. I wanted it to be the middle of, the absolute middle of this square that's down here. So now I can move to the center of this, or I can move out here, and I can recenter this, and I can resize it, and it's assured that it, will, that it will remain in the middle of where it was constructed by using the mode center, or, or basing it on the, the, the center of the selection. I'll use that again in a moment so you can see how that, how that works. So now I've made my base, <coughs> and it looks pretty good. Um, one thing I probably want to do at the moment is that I want to turn off size. I want to deselect the points so that I rem I'm done with it so everything is turned off. And I probably want to create a, a temporary surface for this, right? Because this is on its own layer, it's not going to affect the table. The table is in the background. It's deactivated, as it were. So now when I hit Q again, I can go ahead and I can name this now lamp base. And let's make it purple. Click on here. Make a nice kind of purpley base, and I click OK, click OK, and it changes. <coughs> huh? <coughs> Hit Q. Name, where it says, instead of default, name it. Click on the color picker, give it a color, and then click OK. And it should change the name of it and color it. One more thing that I may want to do with this is that I want to smooth this out. You notice that you can see the individual facets. So what I can do is I can bring up my surface editor, and you'll notice that I have all of these surfaces now. I have table lamp, um, lamp base. I have table legs, table top. I'm going to go back to lamp base, and at the bottom I'm going to turn on smoothing, and notice how it smooths all that out. Now, wherever I use this surface, it will be automatically smoothed. So that's something that you don't want to do always. But I know that I'm not going to use this surface anywhere else, so I'm good to go. <coughs> when I'm done with this, I can turn this off. I should probably save this before too long, so I'm going to go ahead and go File, Save <coughs> Object As, make sure it's in my Object folder, and I'll name it Lamp. And now I'm ready to create the lamp shade. Did you get that? Did it work for you or not? Huh? <coughs> what happened? OK. Well, you just have color wireframe. So go ahead and go back and make sure you have texture shading. Or texture wire. Oh, okay. okay, there you go. Okay, and you have the very last layer selected too, and your table and your lamp are on the same layer. Okay. Remember, you didn't select a separate layer and select background, so that's going to have to be corrected later on. Okay, okay. when I get done with this, I'm going to stop. I'm going to stop the video, and then we're going to go over this. Now, for those of you who already had Chris's class, this is review, right? You guys have already done a lot of this, or yes, or no, or 
Does he do things in a similar fashion or different or I don't know? I'm just going through procedures that I, when I'm building things, this is basically how I approach stuff. And while we're doing it at the same time, I hope you're learning how to use some of the tools, how to modify, how to change the selection modes, how to select points versus polygons, that sort of thing, to build your object. Now for the time being, what I would do next is that I would decide, okay, I'm gonna build a lamp. And remember how I built, I could build it on the same layer, but remember how it interfered with the, when I built the tabletop and the table legs? Well, uh, temporarily what I can do is that I can put my table or my um, lamp shade on a separate layer construct it and then when it's done I can cut it and paste it on the base layer so that they're together, they're joined together. Because if I leave them on separate layers and I move it over to layout, they will work independently of one another. Layers work independently of one another. That can be a good thing if you want to animate them. It can be a bad thing if you choose to keep them as a separate entity. Think of it as just this, as a lampshade and a lamp base are, are separate entities, but they're part of the same thing and they're held together by a screw or something. So if when you move it around in the world, real world, just like the table with the legs, and they are attached in some way, then just when you're done with the object, put them all on one layer. And that's what I'm going to do. If they are separate entities and you want them to, be, to move separate from one another, then they might be on separate layers. So I'm going to select another layer now. <coughs> and I'm going to now click on the second layer, the bottom half, so I just see the lamp base. And I see it in outline. Now I don't need to worry about the table anymore. I'm using my lamp base to determine the proportions of my lamp shade. Again, there's a variety of ways that we can make a lamp shade. I'm going to start with <coughs> a cylinder again. Lamp shades are cylindrical, they're squares, they're multi-sided. Um, some are perfectly cylindrical, some are tapered. There's all different ways of doing it. Well, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to go ahead and hit A to recenter everything. On this third layer, I'm going to go back to create and I'm going to select the disk tool because I want it to be a cylindrical shade and maybe tapered at the top like a cone. So I'm going to go ahead and click and drag from the top like so and pull out my sh you know, the base of my shade and I'm going to pull it up. <clears throat> Let's move this out a little so I can see what's going on here. Let's move this out too. And I'm going to move this up like so. And that looks about right, doesn't it? Yes, no, close. Close enough for government work. <clears throat> but it doesn't look like a shade, does it? It has a top and it has a bottom. And it's not tapered. Now you might think you want to use the cone, but the cone comes to a point. So that doesn't work for me. But I'm part way there. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to turn off the disc. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to taper the top. There's a variety of ways that I can do this. What I'm going to do, <coughs> I can either use the taper tool. That will be found under modify. And I have taper, taper constrain, or I can just select the top and I can resize it. So this is a good time to show you examples of two different kinds of tools and two different ways of modifying an existing object. <coughs> For example, if I just select the top polygon, I'm happy with the base, but I want the top to be smaller, just like I made the base of the lamp bigger, I can make the top of this smaller. And because this top polygon is connected to everything else, everything else will be smaller or, or stretched in as well. So what I can do is make sure again that under mode, 
its action is center of selection. I'm going to select size, and then from the top view, I'm going to click and drag, and notice that I make it smaller. So now I have basically a cone. That's one way of doing it. I still have the top and bottom polygons, but I'm going to worry about those in a minute. I'm going to undo this, and now I'm going to show you a different way of resizing this. I'm going to deselect, I'm going to turn off size, deselect the polygon, and now with nothing selected under modify, I'm going to use taper constrain. You'll find that most of these transform tools here, stretch and size, are really two versions of the same tool. Size resizes both, um, all proportions equally. Stretch allows you to control the X, Y, and Z separately. Taper allows us to do just what you might think. Taper, but it, by, it will allow us to control the taper separately. If I select just taper, watch what happens from the top view. And you'll also notice that it's very important that in the numeric requester, I have lots of fall offs. I can select none or I can select a linear fall off. And this is going to become really, really important when we start to build a reboot character. Really important. These little fall offs function like weight maps, where we can control the degree of bend, where we can control the degree of taper, and that sort of thing. So what I'm going to do now from the top view is I'm going to click and drag. And notice that when I stretch it, I can change the taper of this. But look what it's doing. It's changing the width and the height. That could be something that I want, but it's not. So I'm going to undo. And I want taper constrained. So now when I do that, it changes both dimensions the same. So now when I click on this, it makes it bigger. Or if I move it in, it makes it smaller. So that's another yet another way that we can control the size. I had nothing selected and I used taper to resize the top or I could have reversed this and I could now resize the bottom. So that's what these widgets control. And now if I were to select the middle or the ends, nothing would happen because I don't have enough geometry in the middle, but we'll get to that to another on another day. So now I've started with a cylinder. I've reproportioned it so that it looks more like a lamp shade. I can turn off taper constraint, or I could have resized it. But now I need to deal with, I, I want this to look like just a piece of paper kind of stretched around in a cylindrical form. I don't want a solid. I don't want a top. I don't want a bottom, do I? Lamp shades don't have tops or bottoms. So now what I can do is I can select polygons, and I can select the top one, and I can hit Command X to remove it. And I can then, from the perspective view, I can move down, hold it, ho select the bottom polygon, and hit Command X. And it looks like my whole lampshade has gone away, does it? doesn't it? This is a perfect example to show you that when you start to eliminate polygons from um, any kind of object, but uh, in this particular case, um, it happens to be that we're eliminating parts of, of um, primitives, is that it knew that we were only going to see the outside. So it only made sure that we could see the polygons from the outside, that, so they were one-sided. As soon as we get rid of it, and if we, want, if we took a photograph of our lamp from here, we wouldn't see the back part of our, when it rendered, we wouldn't see the back part of our lampshade. That won't work. So what we have to do now, there's a couple of ways that we can do this. The easiest way for today is to turn this into, a into all of this lampshade into double-sided polygons. To do that, I bring up my surface editor. And before I switch it, I need to put in a placeholder, don't I? So I'm going to hit Q. And I'll make sure that make default is turned off, and I'll name it lamp shade. And I'll click on the little widget here, and I'll make this kind of a light, kind of tan color. Click OK. OK. And again, you can see the outside, but you can't see the inside. 
but you'll notice what we have available to us over here in the surface editor. Not only can we turn on smoothing, so it, whoops, I, got it, now I don't want the, the, the default smooth. I want the lamp shade smooth. Now it smooths that out. But you'll see down here there's a checkbox for double-sided. When I click there, voila. And we can see the back end of it now. It's paper thin, but still, okay, we're just getting started here. You can see how I started with a primitive. I manipulated it slightly, and I tweaked it so that now it looks like the shade that I want. I could have made this another way. I could have used a lathe tool. I could have used a whole bunch of other tools. But this is just one way of, of doing it. So now I have my lamp shade, I have my lamp base, and I have my table. <clears throat> a couple of things that are not complete right now. Remember I said that I want to attach the lamp shade to the base. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to hit Command X to cut the lamp shade from this layer. I can now click on the, the lamp base layer and I can hit Command V for paste. And notice what it does. It remembered the exact size and position of that where it was in the last layer. So it's exactly where it needs to be. I got one more thing that I need to do. I put the lamp or the table in here as a placeholder so I could size my lamp. I don't want the table in here anymore. I already have the table saved elsewhere. Does that make sense? So I can cut this. Now I already have the lamp saved, but you'll notice that the little asterisk is here. And anytime you see that, it means that it needs to be updated. <coughs> Changes have been made since the last time you saved it. So I can do Save As again, or I can just hit Command S, like in most programs, and that saves it. So now that's updated it. So I have my lamp now completed. I have my table completed. The only thing more I need to do is to send it over to layout. I need to put lights in it. I need to refine the surfaces. And I need to render it, and then I'm done. Now watch what happens. I'm going to go ahead, and I'm going to send them over. And then we're going to take a break. And I think that will be it for today so that you can now go back. And I'm going to help each of you build this. And then on Monday, uh, the only thing that I want to do is refine the surfaces so that they look more like the actual surfaces that you would think of. You know, that the, the lampshade has some transparency, translucency. We put a light inside the lampshade. Maybe the base of it is made of ceramic, so it has kind of a sheen to it and reflects light. Maybe the tabletop is made of glass. Maybe the table legs are made of metal. But we can add all of those attributes, okay? and render it so it looks pretty nice. <clears throat> now that these are saved and I have layout open, watch what happens. I'm going to go to File, and I'm going to say Send Object to Layout. And I do that, and there's my lampshade floating in the middle of the air. In Layout, it remembers the exact position and size I had created in Modeler. And now I can go back to Modeler, and I can switch from Lamp to Table, and I can once again say send object to layout and voila. It's exactly where I wanted it, positioned where I wanted it, sized the way I wanted it because I had done a little bit of pre-planning in Modeler. If I decided I wanted a huge lamp or I wanted it smaller, I can select the lamp. And if I wanted a little tiny lamp on here or I wanted some humongous lamp on it, and I can always go back and I can modify this and I can go ahead and select size, or I can select stretch or squash, and I can resize this. Now it's becoming an incredibly large lamp. Hit T for move and pull it down so that it's on there. So now I have a huge lamp on a little table, or I can make the tamp table bigger. I can stretch the table. There's a variety of things that you can do afterwards. The reason that you're going to want to make them this way is that later on, you know, it, after you've done this enough, you're going to build a library of items, right? And if I have a room and it, and it has two end tables, 
and it has a lamp on each end table that look identical. They both look identical to one another. I'm not going to build two of each, like you know Noah's Ark. I'm only going to build one and duplicate it and send it over, and that's it. Does that make sense? So if you have each item saved separately in your library of items, you can always you can keep bringing it in and resizing it and making changes of it, changes to it, as many times as you like in layout. And we can change the properties of it in layout too, because you'll notice in layout, let me undo this a couple times, <coughs> is that when I bring up my surface editor, this is not the same surface editor. You'll notice that I have two of them here. There's one for layout that do look identical to one another, and there is one for modeler. But the one that I have in layout will give me lots more options change. You'll notice that if for every object that you have saved, it gives us a separate little item here. And that when you twirl down, you lose, you use a little twirly, you'll see that however many surfaces you have created for that object will be there. And we can come back in here and we can change all of its attributes, any or none. And that's what we're going to do on Monday. Okay? Now, you don't have to send this over to layout today. What I want you to do is to feel comfortable with the tools and building a table and building a lamp. And it doesn't have, they don't have to look like mine. Okay. Before I turn off the video recorder, is there anything that you want me to review that I've done today? Because it, it, it looks simple, but I've covered a lot. Especially if you've never worked in the 3D environment. <clears throat> There's a lot to think about. With working in 3D, it's like patting your head and rubbing your stomach at the same time. There's lots of things to think about. It's that when you select something in Modeler, you know, am I selecting the whole object? Am I selecting a polygon or am I selecting points? You know, um, when I'm moving them, um, do I need to be concerned about the mode? Am I moving it from the center of the selection? Or do I care? Do I just move the whole thing? Does it matter? Um, are they all on one layer? Or are they on separate layers? There's a lot of things to consider when you're, when you're doing this. I mean, for example, if I wanted to really tweak this and make it look really weird, um, I could go ahead and I can select switch to points. And I could just select a point here, and I could select a point here, hold down the shift key, a point here, <coughs> and I could hit um, T for move. I can move this up. Whoops. Make sure that, there we go, T is selected, and I can, oh, come on. What object is read only? That can't be. What's going on here? Oh boy, time to turn it off, huh? Let me try this again. Select a point, hit T for move. Let's see. Um, I have no idea why that's happened. I hope yours aren't that way. This is still in complete view, but it shows it as read only. And I don't know why that is. I hope yours don't do that. So if I look at content nine and I look at objects and I select um, the table and I hit command I for info, it shows that it's locked. I don't know why that is. It shouldn't be locked. Now it's unlocked, and each one, I guess, needs to be, huh, it was read and write, and I want these to be, huh, read and write, read and write, okay, anyway, now it should work, I hope, T for move. Come on, T for move. Object is read only. 
Didn't I change the table? I did. It doesn't want, I need to fix this. So that's the end of my demo for today. <coughs> and let me turn on the lights and then I'll have all of you build a table and lamp today.